Happy and nice to see everyone. Welcome. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here with Create and Learn and really happy to be introducing Nicole uh, Lunning. Um, she works at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. She's the Deputy Osiris Rex Curator. And basically what that means is she's an expert in um, meteorites and asteroids. And uh, she helps us understand how rocky bodies formed in the solar system. And her official job is petrologist. And so she's going to explain some really, really amazing things about um, the Osiris Rex mission to Bennu, the asteroid. It's a super, super exciting thing. Um, I've got kind of my own little simulation of an asteroid. Um, Nicole can tell me if, it's, if it looks like that in real life. But uh, anyways, welcome. And thanks, thanks for everyone for being here today. Over to you, Nicole. I'm not sure if we're hearing uh, Nicole here. Are you coming through muted or I'm not hearing you. <laughs> here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I lose all those zoom controls once I go into slideshow mode. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. I like your asteroid. It doesn't quite look like my favorite asteroid, <laughs> Bennu, but it does look, uh, there are probably some asteroids that look like that because there are a lot of different shapes of asteroids. So I'm going to start with a little bit more about me, but that was a great introduction, Bruce. I um, grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I did a lot of school. I did public school for um, all the way through 12th grade, and then I got a bachelor's degree at the University of Chicago, a master's degree at University of California, Davis. And then at that point, I was actually um, a, a terrestrial and earth geologist. But then I fell in love with meteorites, which are rocks from asteroids, and went and got a PhD at University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, I went and worked at the Smithsonian, which is the US National Museum in Washington, DC, um, and got introduced to a whole lot of meteorites there, um, and also how you take care of them, as well as doing my own scientific research, doing experiments to simulate the kinds of processes that form um, the rocks that are on asteroids. And also, a, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago actually, I went to Antar Antarctica through New Zealand um, to search for meteorites um, in Antarctica and those meteorites that we brought back are actually part of a collection that NASA and the Smithsonian take care of and loan out to researchers. And I just want to emphasize this point, most meteorites come from asteroids. Our solar system's asteroid belt is located between Mars and Jupiter in our solar system. It's a lot of um, rocks that are sort of left over from the formation of the solar system. And meteorites come to us when asteroids collide with each other and pieces get knocked off and they can evolve earth crossing orbits and earth has a very big gravity well so over geologic time scales which is a few million years kind of five to ten million years time scales a lot of asteroids that are earth crossing are likely to be pulled into earth's gravity well and you might see them as a beautiful meteor in the sky um, and if they're big enough, something will survive all the way to the ground. And that's when we have a meteorite for um, scientists like me to study. And this is, until fairly recently, this and telescopes was all we knew about meteorites. But as you'll see, that will change. But as I mentioned, I went and looked for meteorites in Antarctica. And usually when I give a presentation, if I don't cover this, people ask, why do we go to Antarctica? And so I wanted to ask you in the chat, why do you think Antarctica might be a better place to find meteorites than anywhere else on Earth? So please tell me in the chat. And also while you're chatting, you can see we were um, in the remote field deep in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. We lived in tents. My team was there for a month by ourselves, nobody else around for hundreds of miles, um, just the eight of us on our team, but we found lots of meteorites and it was incredibly fun. I see people are answering in the chat. I know you can't see it, Nicole. So maybe Francis and Bruce going forward, you guys can read this for or pick something new to read for Nicole. I think people are just saying there's less people there. That's why. Um, I think that's the most popular answer. Whole urbanization. That's the main answer. Yeah. Yeah, because it's at the poles, because it's cold, um, open land. Mm -hmm. That's uh, come from Sarif. Yeah, 
and yeah, the sort of at the end of the end of the world. Yeah. Do you so, see the chat from people, Bruce? I do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. So you guys hit on a few of the ones. Whoever said it's cold, that's actually an awesome one because when it's that cold, it's also effectively a desert. So it's also very dry. And one of the things that really rapidly breaks down rocks and especially meteorites is water and humidity. So even though there's lots of ice, it stays frozen all the time in Antarctica. So I was there in the summer and we would just leave frozen food outside because it would stay frozen because it was well below the freezing point. Um, yeah. So the fact that it's a cold desert means the meteorites last longer, um, but, and also that there are you know, lots of open space. You can see for a long time when we, we do a couple different ways where we search. We can just drive around on snow machines and you can, in some cases, see from, you know, tens of meters away, a rock that you're like, that might be a meteorite. I better drive over and check it out. Mm -hmm. So not lots of open space, not many people is a great answer. The other thing is that Antarctica, because it's massive ice is ice flowing, that ice actually kind of flows roughly from um, where the South Pole is into the Transantarctic Mountains. So any meteorite that falls on that ice over the course of thousands of years will actually slowly be conveyed to the Transantarctic Mountains and then it can get stuck in places that we call stranding surfaces. And we go and look for those places. So basically the ice flows have delivered a bunch of meteorites that fell on the earth over long periods of time to certain places and we can go there and just find hundreds of meteorites sometimes in a season. Pranav, so, Pranav, Pranav had a good one. Uh, he said, uh, due to strong gravity, I mean, that's how all meteorites come to Earth. So you're absolutely right. That's that's why we get meteorites. And um, we kind of clear out the orbit of Earth by pulling um, rocks into, into us. But meteorites actually fall fairly randomly, close to randomly uh, over the course of the Earth. It's just that they don't survive very well, right? So anybody who lives in humid areas like Alabama or um, Chicago or Houston, where I'm from, if a meteorite falls there, it will rapidly be broken up by the environmental factors, by water. Just like if you left you know, a metal toy outside, it would rust really mm. rapidly. That happens to meteorites too. They'll just fall apart um, if you don't find them quickly in those kind of places. But places like the deserts in Australia, the deserts in North, North Africa, meteorites last longer, but there isn't a mechanism like the ice flows mm. concentrating them, but they still are great places to search for meteorites. Sam, Sam said, because it has the most magnetic field and the most meteorites have magnetic things that they, they pull them in. So although you're right, the Earth's magnetic field that does go through the sort of rotational axis roughly, um, it's not strong enough to actually pull in rocks, but that's a great idea. All right, I might go on and tell you a little bit about what we've learned about our early solar system from meteorites, and then I'll talk about what we can learn more from asteroid samples from OSIRIS-REx. So one of the things that we know about solar systems from astronomy is they form out of molecular clouds and they form disks from the clouds collapsing on themselves and spinning. And so this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of that process of the formation of a disk. And I'm gonna show you in the next slide some cartoons. Right, so we start out as this sort of amorphous cloud, but you start spinning, that disk spreads out, and you start to form the precursor to our sun, the, the object that formed before our sun. And so we have this plane of material that extends outward from the sun, and that's the plane that our planets um, revolve around the Earth on now, as well as asteroids mostly do, but not quite as um, well-manneredly. And from that, we formed um, material out of the gas. And a lot of that is what we can learn about from asteroids because all the planets have had lots of processes that have happened since then. So the evidence for the, what happened is mostly destroyed on the planets, but in asteroids, we can find it. And one of the things that we can see that's an interesting signature in meteorites is that some elements, um, elements of the periodic table, like I'm showing here, really want to stay in a gas phase. So they're less likely to end up um, in asteroids and ultimately in planets. And some elements really sort of don't like being in the gaseous phase. So helium is an element that really likes to be a gas, an element we call a volatile element, and the elements aluminum and calcium really don't like being gases. They're what we call refractory, and they will be they are some of the first elements to become solids in our solar system. Um, but I want you to think about if you've heard of anything or interacted with anything in your life that has either helium, calcium, or aluminum, 
So please tell me in the chat things that you, you might know of that contain these elements. Um, aluminum balloons from Anna. Uh, bones contain calcium. Yeah, absolutely. Alu aluminum foil. Uh, yeah. Milk. Milk. Yeah. Um, balloons, balloons, balloons. Um, teeth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, calcium. And uh, cheese. That mm -hmm. Cheese coming. Lots of great answers coming through from many people. From Sadak, Theodore, Ahmed, Drewy, Zane. Thanks for all the great answers. Yeah, yeah. All of that milk, dairy that then becomes our bones and our teeth, those all were some of the first elements that um, condensed out of the gas in our early solar system. And over time, they've gone through lots of processes, but they've ended up in us and in our food, which is pretty cool. And we can also see evidence of this process in meteorites. This is a meteorite called the Allende meteorite. It fell in northwestern. Um, Mexico in 1969, and this is a slice of it, but there are some objects in it that are actually very calcium and aluminum rich, and they are dated to be the oldest things that formed in our solar system. So here are these fluffy white things. Those are the first solid materials that formed in our solar system, um, which is a pretty amazing thing that you can look at and point at, that that was sort of the first, first solid object for sort of thing that wasn't a gas in our solar system. And there's lots of other things like this that formed as small objects. And you can kind of see some of these as little round things in class in this Allende meteorite. This is a way that meteorites, which are pieces of asteroids, preserve the earliest time of our solar system. And this is sort of a cartoon showing at the top. These are what we kind of sometimes, if you know any geology, are sort of like sediments. They're little particles um, below an inch or a centimeter scale. Um, that were free floating in that solar nebula, on, in that disk. Um, and then those are created to form slightly larger bodies called planetesimals. And they're still much smaller than a planet and even smaller than our moon, but, but they're big enough that they could have some geologic processes. And some of these became kind of like mini planets with a dense iron nickel core and outer crust. Um, and, but there's other ones like the Allende meteorite I just showed you and the rocks that we think will come from Bennu, Osiris-Rex's target, um, that are from these uh, asteroids that archive those early, early solar nebular materials that have undergone very, very little alteration um, and haven't undergone high temperature geologic processes that change them. And so they're the preserve they preserve the building blocks of our solar system, including things like organic molecules, not biological, not living organisms, but the things that we think were needed for the first life to arise. And that's one of the things we're really interested in finding out from the Osiris-Rex mission. A question came we, in from, from Ma, sorry, um, Nicole. How do you identify an element on a meteorite? So there's multiple ways that you can analyze meteorites using um, their chemistry. So we can, one of the things we'll actually do is sort of shoot an electron beam at a very specific tiny point, and we'll see what x-rays come off of it. And different elements have characteristic x-rays, basically specific wavelengths of x-rays that are associated with that element. So that's one way we can. There's a number of different ways we can do chemistry on meteorites, depending on how willing we are to destroy them um, and, and what conditions we need. So there's a lot, lots and lots of different chemistry. Um, but so if you're interested in elements and solar system, please study chemistry because um, it can, you can, we can learn so much when we apply chemistry to these kinds of rocks. And Pooj has an interesting question. How are asteroids preserved in space? And, so how, and, and had further, how do you know how old they are? Yeah, so they are still orbiting the sun. So they're orbiting the sun the way the planets do. They're a little bit farther out than Mars for the most part. That's where most of them are, um, but inward of to the, towards the sun of Jupiter. So that's how they're preserved. They're in a space where there aren't any big planets to pull them into their gravity wells. Um, oh, right. And the estimate of time of ages we have actually comes from measuring meteorites, from recognizing that meteorites come from asteroids, and then using things like radioactive dating methods um, to determine how old the meteorites are. Okay, and Ari uh, would like to know, in the pictures of you finding a rock from a meteoroid, why were you using tweezers to pick it up? 
I didn't want to contaminate it. So the, that rock was not going to hurt me at all. It's wonderful, perfect basaltic breccia rock. Um, but I didn't want to get any of my, um, you know, you can have um, material, even though it was cold, so I was wearing gloves, but I didn't want to get any oils from my hands or, you know, any pieces of hair that might have been stuck to my gloves on the meteorite, because all of that would contaminate it if somebody later wanted to um, try to analyze for those things. So even though it's been in Antarctica and we know it's been exposed to Antarctica, we want to limit the any additional contamination we do. So that's why we would pick it up with tongs. And we carefully put it in a bag with the tongs and then seal the bag up. Awesome. Some great questions coming in here from Sam and Nish. And, um, but I guess we've got a few more slides to go through, right, Nicole? <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about this stuff, so I love the questions. The questions so, are great. Keep them, keep them coming, guys. Um, so that's sort of thinking about a chemistry way. We can also think about more of a physical mechanical way of how these objects in our sol solar system form, right? We start out tiny little particles condensing from gas. Those can actually be attracted to each other by electrostatic forces, the same way if you live in a place that gets really cold in the winter, you might, you know, have cat hair or, you know, static electricity happen where like things kind of stick to you. That we think actually happened um, when you are in really low gravity, it, it um, can actually make sort of fairly large scale um, objects. And then further accretion happened until you get to a point that you get those larger bodies, those planetesimals that are more like mini planets. And then from then we start to form even larger bodies that have runaway growth. And that's what led to the planet formation in our solar system. And asteroids are kind of left over from before you get to the runaway growth. But they're sort of, sometimes we refer to them as, you know, the leftovers of the solar system. Um, hmm. And so that, uh, Oh, go for it. Nish, Nish, Nish would really like to know, is there a difference from uh, between rocks and crystals on Earth and, and the rocks and crystals in space? There are some differences, but there are also um, some similarities, right? So sometimes we'll have um, a mineral that can exist on Earth, so it's a crystal structure, and some of those also exist on asteroids. Um, not all vice versa, because it takes different geologic processes to make different minerals. But we do have all the elements that are on Earth are on asteroids. They just are in different concentrations in different places because Earth has had all of these generations and generations of geologic processes that have concentrated things in different ways. And also the, the processes that happen on Earth reset things. So they kind of like start radioactive clocks over at zero and things like that, where because the um, the crystals and rocks on asteroids are mostly really old. Those, um, their clocks have been running for about 4.5 billion, 4 billion years. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, yeah, that, that answers Kai's question, how old is Bennu? And, uh, and Ayu asks, um, are there asteroids that have been around since the Big Bang? So probably not quite since the Big Bang because it took, we didn't actually have solid things for a little while after the Big Bang. Because the Big Bang, it actually took a little while for elements to form. Um, so we don't have asteroids that are quite as old as the Big Bang, but there maybe could have been asteroids or something like asteroids that formed in earlier generation solar systems, but they probably wouldn't have had all the elements that we have because our solar system inherited elements that formed in supernovae. So they required previous generations of stars formation. Um, so so there, there, we know there are asteroids in other solar systems from um, astronomers who have observed evidence of them, but they, they wouldn't be quite as old as the beginning of the solar system because it takes a little while to start having um, the, the enough elements for planets and for, or at least what we think of as planets and asteroids. Great question. So many good questions coming in, guys. <laughs> but we need to let uh, uh, Nicole uh, present a few more slides. <laughs> but keep them coming. Great. If I can't get through all the slides, that's OK. All right. So, um, but that feeds into that in my next. So a lot of what is recorded in asteroids is from the very beginning of the solar system, about 4.5 billion years ago. But asteroids, they, they still have been doing a little bit of stuff. They have collisions. They have impact melting. We have formation of um, material that gets ejected and re-accreted, which we call regolith. Um, to form what we now see as our, our asteroids in our solar system. And as you I kind of have already picked up on, there's 
sort of two types of samples from asteroids we have. We have meteorites. These are the ones that naturally come to us. The solar system delivers them to us, you know, and they fall through this, come through the sky as a bright fire ball. But in this case, we usually don't know exactly where they came from. We're getting better at estimating where in the asteroid they built felt they came from because we have so many cameras in our world now that we can track back their orbital features. And then we have um, samples like those we're going to get from Bennu um, and a few that have, there's been two Japanese missions, JAXA missions, that have brought back um, small materials from two different asteroids. And the benefit of return samples, ones where we send a spacecraft or maybe in the future a human being um, to collect samples is we know exactly where they came from. So that's one of the benefits. There's a few others, and I think some of your questions have mean that you guys might have some ideas. So I wanted you to, in the chat, maybe think about how do you think return samples might be different than meteorites? What maybe scientifically um, do we have advantages if we're looking at a return sample compared to a meteorite? Don't get me wrong, meteorites are great, but there are some things we can do better with return samples. Yeah, that means like bringing back a sample from an asteroid, right? That's yeah, from an asteroid or just a return sample is anyone where a human project goes and gets it and brings it back. So it could, we may have return samples from Mars at some point in our future. The Apollo samples are return samples from the moon. Okay, here's some great answer. It's, it's more pure. Um, it's more in space. Um, returning samples have different chemicals. Um, return samples are parts of rock and you know where it has come from. Um, you can test the surrounding area. Uh, because you know where it came from and so on. Exposed Great to oxygen. Job. Wow, impressive, guys. Yeah, yeah, you got them all, I think. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the lower contamination, when you said that they're more pure, absolutely. Um, we have better knowledge of any contamination they experience because we can keep track of everything that happened to them. Um, the one disadvantage is we tend to have smaller quantities. Because meteorites have been falling to Earth, basically the entire history of the Earth, um, we, if we can keep finding new ones, but um, we have a, a little more material for meteorites. They're rare, but the return samples we have are incredibly um, material limited. So we, we need to really know what we're doing before we analyze return samples in a destructive way. So now for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about OSIRIS-REx. You can ask me questions about other things, but that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, OSIRIS-REx is the name of the mission. It is an acronym. We do love acronyms at NASA. This is one of those acronyms where they wanted it to spell out something cool, but the things they called out are all relevant. It's origins, because it's focused on the origin of life, particularly the building blocks. So the elements, not just elements related to carbon, but also then basic molecules that we think needed to exist for life to arise. Spectral interpretation, that's something the spacecraft did, resource identification, and also security, right? So OSIRIS-REx is a near-Earth asteroid, so it is an asteroid that we do have to be a little bit worried about it um, hitting Earth. And last is regolith, exploring that outer um, material on the surface of the asteroid. So here's an artist transition of the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft getting read, ready to do a sampling. It already did its sampling a little over a year ago, but I wanted you to look at this picture and think about um, how do you think the spacecraft collected rocks and dust from asteroid Bennu, um, and where do you think the sample is stored for its return to Earth? So take a look at this picture and please, please tell me in the chat. Okay, some answers coming through. Um, a drill, ro robotic arm, and a vacuum, vacuum cleaner to collect it. Uh, chem cam, it's stored in an, a storage tank from even um, in a heat fridge. I think it goes up the tube and is stored inside uh, with a drill. Um, special interpretation, they drill on asteroids and um, well, this is a question, sorry. <laughs> um, there's a pole on the bottom of the spaceship to hold the rocks. It had a scoop-like contraption. Those are most of them. Great answer. Those are all great guesses from just looking at the picture. And um, 
you, some of you got them. So here's some labels. So the first one, which is the circle that's closer to the top in red, that's the sample return capsule. That's actually where the sample will be stored um, on its way back to Earth, and that capsule will carry it back through the Earth's atmosphere to return it to us. Um, so I know I heard at least one arm. So you can see in that sort of more oval yellow, that's the arm. So that's actually when the spacecraft was flying to Bennu, that was curled up a little bit. But in, when it got ready to do the collection, it um, kind of bent the arm out at its elbow. And at the bottom is what we call the tag sem head or the sampler head. Um, and we call it that because it's tag is touch and go. Um, and then it's sample acquisition mechanism. And I think a few of you said vacuum cleaner, which is pretty close to a vacuum cleaner. I'll show you how it works. Um, but basically the spacecraft just approached the asteroid. Um, it didn't exactly land, but it touched the surface, collected some sample, and then backed off. But before I get to that, now that you've thought about this spacecraft with this long arm extending out to it, we can get to the name of the asteroid, right? So NASA, a lot of NASA likes to do naming contests for things. So if you follow NASA on Twitter or something like that, you potentially could participate in a future um, naming contest. But they did one a few years ago to name Bennu, because before that it just had kind of a number, which isn't as much fun. And this nine-year-old Michael from North Carolina um, submitted one saying the spacecraft looked kind of like a heron. and um, Bennu is an Egyptian mythical bird, um, like a heron. And so that's part of why um, out of thousands of students who submitted suggestions, that was the one that was picked um, because they, the team and the um, judges thought that was really apt. To these, a bird with a really long, thin legs does look kind of like the, the spacecraft, the Osiris Rex spacecraft with that long sampler arm. And why did they choose this asteroid to go to, right? There's over half a million asteroids. Um, they did want to go to a near-Earth asteroid, so we have at least 7,000 of those that are recognized. Um, and with the kind of right orbits for us to get to in a couple years, which for space missions isn't too long. Um, and then ones that are kind of on the big side, which in the case of near-Earth asteroids, big side is um, over 200 meters, which if you have run on a track that goes around a football field, like an American football field, that's about halfway around the track for the diameter of the asteroid. But then kind of the last, they narrowed it down and only five were carbon rich. And since OSIRIS-REx is interested in finding the building blocks of life, we're carbon-based life. So those building blocks are things that are called amino acids and other organic compounds that usually involve carbon. So Bennu is thought to be carbon rich and that's, that's kind of what really sealed the deal on going for Bennu. But when OSIRIS-REx got to Bennu, we got kind of a surprise. We were expecting it to be very smooth, kind of like the model Bruce showed earlier, that it would be kind of a sandy surface. And it turned out to be just completely covered, or not completely, but close to completely covered in big boulders, boulders that were you know, multiple feet or multiple meters or more across. Um, and that presented a little bit of a challenge because as we mentioned, the um, sampler mechanism is kind of like a vacuum, a little bit. So here's a cartoon showing how the um, sampling mechanism works. It actually injects um, compressed nitrogen into the soil and then rolls it up and pulls it into um, its sample holding uh, internal part. So just quickly in the chat, why do you think a bunch of boulders presented a problem for this um, sampling mechanism? Uh, there wouldn't be a good surface to land on from Jaylene. It is tiny, Jaylene, but and um, tiny, there was not enough space. And, um, there was not enough because space. it might clog it. Um, nowhere to land. Um, uneven surfaces make it difficult. Um, it's not flat, and so on. Great answers from yeah, yeah. Rana, right. Jenna, right. Momo, Andy, and many, many Andy, others. And many, 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 others. many of the answers. Right. Answers. Exactly, exactly. Great job, guys. Um, right, so here's just an uh, image that kind of shows what the surface of Bennu looks like, right? You can see all those big boulders. So they had to really carefully look for a sample site and also do a really careful procedure to land. And what they did is required, actually, since you guys are, since you all are um, interested in coding and programming, I thought you'd be really 
particularly interested in this, which is they used a type of autonomous programming that we call natural feature tracking. So the spacecraft had spent a long time taking many pictures of the surface of Bennu. They selected potential sample sites and then carefully, carefully imaged those sample sites. So we knew where every potential dangerous, threatening rock is, everywhere um, around the few little spots that were flat enough and had small enough rocks that this sample head could pick them up or pull them in with the nitrogen. So, um, but I also want you to think about, right, we needed an autonomous way to do this, right? You may have a remote control car or you have flown a drone before. Um, why couldn't we do this with um, OSIRIS-REx at Bennu? Tell me in the chat if you know. Um, so it wouldn't get broken, a delay, it's too far away. Um, delay you, too far away. Are yeah, it. we couldn't see through it. Um, it would float away uh, to find where we can collect the sample without someone being in charge. Hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, so they picked out where they wanted to find the sample, but the spacecraft needed to do this maneuver within a space of, you know, a, about 15 minutes or so, you know. And at that point, Bennu was far enough away from Earth that it would have taken several minutes each way for the radio signal to go back and forth between Earth and Bennu. So the spacecraft would have crashed if it needed somebody driving it on Earth. Um, so it needed to have a program that could run by itself. Um, people had, were involved in flagging the threats and teaching it what it needed to know, but this is one, one example of many from spaceflight of better coding abilities, better computational and program, and is particularly artificial intelligence, lets us land and sample um, with much, much greater precision than we could 30 years ago when we couldn't teach spacecraft to do these things. We couldn't teach them to make decisions like this autonomously by themselves. So that's one of the really powerful things about coding and programming is we can do new things um, as we have better computational ability and more um, sophisticated programmers too. Uh, Jaitra had an interesting comment. We didn't know the positioning of the rocks, therefore they programmed them autonomously using various rocks. So someday hopefully we can do that. In this case, they had carefully imaged the site they chose, so they did know where the rocks were, but the uh, spacecraft had a library of those images and it was taking pictures as it went down and matching those to the images it already had. And it was like, oh, that's the rock I need to watch out for. Readjust a little bit. Oh, that's one of the other rocks I need to watch out for. Um, so in this case, the spacecraft did know, but someday we could probably do a mission much faster if that was possible. So I hope we can do that someday. Now I'm going to show you a video the spacecraft took as it approached Bennu. So here you can see that sampler had the tag sam approaching. You can see the the rocks, and these are relatively small rocks, and then you can see when it touches down, it actually sinks a bit into the surface, and it readjusted itself a little bit to get the best spot possible. And then you can see a bunch of dust and debris kick back up too. And it actually sunk in much farther than we expected. We expected the surface to push back on it a little bit. And the arm actually has a spring in it, like a pogo stick, which it didn't need, um, because we expected the ground to be a little harder and more resistant. So this was really successful. Um, this happened, like I said, a little over a year ago. We, everyone on the mission team was super happy. Um, and then uh, the spacecraft backed off towards space and we, the cameras you know, were pointed at the, this is the bottom of that sampler head and everyone was really surprised to see, you can see those little particles, those are leaking out of the sampler head because it got so full of material. We were basically too successful um, and stuff started to leak out. So they had planned to do a few maneuvers um, with the full sampler head, but once we saw stuff was leaking out, the mission decided that they needed to stow it quickly. And so they stowed it in, that's the bottom half of that sample return capsule that some of you noticed on the image of the spacecraft before. And so that's the sampler head um, being tucked into it. And then there's a clamshell on top that came down for the rest of its trip back to earth. But before we left Bennu, we did one last thing. We actually, the spacecraft imaged the site where we did the sampling. 
why do you think we did that imaging of the site after after the sampling events? We'd already collected the sample. We didn't have to worry about trying to do it again. Um, tell me in the chat quick um, what you think. To get a before and after shot from Samadhi uh, for future use to see where it was collected from um, so we could see how the asteroid changed. Um, good ones coming in from Anne and Reed and Krita and Ethan. Um, yeah, to see if it changes Lindsay and Seraph for future use for research. And uh, yeah, and to see if aliens are real. Ooh, from Aaron. <laughs> Don't be surprised. We're always on the lookout for that. Um, we didn't see if aliens were real, but we did actually, you can see in this little GIF, um, the before and after image. And um, like a lot of you hit on your in your concept, um, answers, we wanted to see if we change it. We actually can see, so since the sampler had sunk in a little over a foot and a half, you can see actually we brought up darker material, that the material under the surface is a little different than what's on the very surface. Also, there's a circle between those images. You can actually see that this sampling event kind of threw this rock, which is a pretty good sized rock, um, you know, about 10 meters. So we were all surprised by that too. It's pretty cool. So then after that, the spacecraft departed Bennu. And so it was a little bittersweet because every, you know everybody loves Bennu who's been involved in this project and who's been following it. But I know for me, I'm super excited because it means it's on its way back to Earth. And that's where um, things really ramp up for me and my team. Because in September 2023, it's gonna come back to Earth. So that's the sample return capsule. This is how we we'll hope it will look. It will land in the desert in Utah. Um, and hopefully we will have a nice smooth landing and we can go get this capsule and start to study the material it brought back. And that's where we get into what I'm part of at Johnson Space Center, which is curation, taking care of samples. And so here's just an example of some of the collections that we take care of at Johnson Space Center in Houston um, in the Astro Materials, which are extraterrestrial samples um, uh, division. So one of the things I wanna call your attention to is look at those pictures on the bottom of this slide. That's a, what people in, in astromaterials creation do when they work in labs and work with astromaterials. What do you notice about them? Um, please tell me in the chat. They're all working in space. Um, they're wearing suits, protective suits, um, special coverings. They're clean, no contamination. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Special right? Gear, you can all wearing those, yeah. yeah. Those, sort of we're all suit, those are clean room suits. And like you said, a bunch of them are reaching into glove boxes. So those are um, specially designed um, glove boxes to protect the samples. So you can handle them in the gloves with your hands, but not contaminate them. Um, those are just a few examples. And so what a lot of people ask me is the sample isn't coming back till 2023, what are you doing? And I'm actually very busy, the team I'm on is very busy because we have a lot of stuff to do to keep track of everything the space um, craft came in contact with before it launched. We've been working on building a clean lab. We have lots and lots of preparation for sample recovery and lots of preparation for when the sample comes back. So I'll tell you a little bit about those things. So one of the things we're really, um, pay a lot of attention to is something we call contamination knowledge. And this is basically tracking anything that the spacecraft or ultimately in our lab, the sample might be exposed to. And as we talked about before with return samples, the advantage is we can know everything that it was exposed to because we are the ones who did it, right? So one of the things we do is we actually put out these things called witness plates. And so they're like, you know, a witness on a crime TV show. They're um, chemically watching everything um, so we, kept all of these, we changed them out once every month and analyzed one of each of them to make sure nothing was going wrong, but then we saved the other three. So if we have a surprise later, we can go back and say, hey, did this happen when this spacecraft was being built or you know, somewhere in transportation because we have, we have that witness. And this is just an example of a few of the places that witness plates were deployed before the spacecraft was launched. This is not all of them, but you can see there's these sort of different snapshots of all the process that goes into building a spacecraft. We also sent witness plates on the spacecraft with that sample collector head 
um, and inside of the sample return capsule to witness everything the sample might have been exposed to in space, both what the spacecraft was exposed to before it got to Bennu, and there's some places where there's kind of gates, so we have different parts of the mission captured in what in um, with, with these same kind of chemical witnesses. Um, and we'll also do this when we prepare for recovery in Utah when it comes back. So we'll set up a portable clean lab so that once we um, recover the return capsule, we can quickly take it to the clean lab, do a few safety things um, before we send the rest of the sample return capsule um, back to Johnson Space Center. And these pictures are here are from the Stardust mission, which it came back to Earth, and most of them are from Stardust in 2008. And we have a very similar sample return capsule, but a very different sample. And there's a couple different kinds of material that we'll actually bring back. There's a, most of it will be the material that's inside of the sample collector head that the um, nitrogen gas rolled up into the sample. But there's um, a few other, we kind of expect there to be some asteroid material, lots of different places that we'll collect. We've just completed construction of the lab um, that these samples will be the home of those Cyrus Rex samples. But as you can see, other than my friend and colleague, Kevin, who's in the, the lab on the far left, and one table and some more witness plates, because we're also doing witness plates for the new lab, um, it's pretty empty right now. So we have a lot of work to do to outfit it to get it all ready for the lab. So we're purchasing things. We are very careful about what materials will go into that lab, because we're really worried about contamination. So almost everything will be stainless steel. Uh, and we're also developing specific new things for these samples to handle uh, these specific samples and to take the spacecraft apart. And one of those things is designing new special um, nitrogen cabinets. So we keep the, our astro materials at Johnson Space Center for the most part in nitrogen atmospheres um, to protect them. And I'll show you a video. This is my colleague actually working on Apollo samples. Let's see if. Um, in a nitrogen glove box, you can see that cylindrical thing that's coming out from the glove box, that's its airlock, right? So it's kind of the reverse of a space station. And you can see my colleague, Dr. Julianne Gross, she's handling these very small class and um, sealing them into tiny Teflon bags. And so all of the work she's doing, she has to do through these gloves carefully in this pure nitrogen atmosphere. Why do you think we do all of this in a nitrogen atmosphere? So tell me in the chat. Um, Tanish uh, says to keep it preserved. Keep it preserved. Absolutely. To keep it and clean from, mm -hmm, to ensure that it's not damaged from Zarif and Yvonne and Anne Floyd says, so it's like space to protect it from Lily. Candace says to keep it like it was. No bacteria growth. Oh, it's coming through fast now. <laughs> Keep it from being affected by a virus and so on and so forth. Great answers. Yeah, awesome answers. Um, yeah, it, it's all to protect it. And as you said, like, right, it's going to limit bacteria growth, right? We are bringing back samples that we think contain the building blocks of life. If you've got regular earth bacteria onto it, they would just munch all over these samples. So um, nitrogen is really inert. And it's right close to 80% of Earth's atmosphere. So nitrogen isn't bad for us as human beings, but most organisms on Earth use the oxygen and the tiny bit of CO2 in our atmosphere as really important things to live on. So if you don't give them that, if you just have pure nitrogen, you do really limit any bacteria that could grow in that sample, as well as oxidation. Things like when you think of rusting, that requires the oxygen in our atmosphere. And so that you're, you're right, this is a way we preserve the samples. So this is a preliminary mock-up and we've been practicing, practicing disassembling all sorts of materials in the specially designed glove box is we're working on making because nobody else does this, right? This isn't something we can just order off the internet. We need to design one specifically for our purpose that we can use in the, the ways we're gonna need it. So we're getting, I know we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna skip that question. This is just a number of my colleagues who are on our team, um, and we're gonna actually end up hiring even more people, but um, this is a great group of people who are incredibly smart and doing all sorts of planning and organizing and getting the labs ready. Um, Bruce wanted me to call out internships and student opportunities at NASA. These are a few different links. Um, 
for both direct internships through NASA for Johnson Space Center. We also have a relationship with the Lunar and Planetary Science Institute, which does some college student um, summer internships and more for like college and beyond. Um, a lot of NASA's workforce, workforce are actually contractors. So right now, um, one of our main contractors is Jacob. So a number of my colleagues actually work for Jacobs and they have opportunities as well for students and recent college grads to get involved in the kind of work we do at NASA. So I know we're getting close on time, Bruce. Should we um, try to do this activity? I, yeah, for sure. Um, at least give, the, give them a chance to experiment with it. This is a really exciting thing. If you could lead us into this interesting activity, please, uh, Nicole. Yeah, so I'm going to switch to sharing my browser, but I'm going to be going to this website called trek.nasa.gov uh, slash Bennu um, to explore. This is all imagery of Bennu that the spacecraft collected. Yeah, And, and you, you can actually... You guys are all invited to, to go to this site and, and play with this. And, you know, it's really, really interesting. So here I will... I'll share that in the link right now. So you guys can actually visit uh, Bennu and help us to find a good place to land, a good place not to land. And um, Nicole will explain the details. Yeah, so if you can see my um, Google Chrome browser, if you first get here, you'll be offered to do a tutorial, which I'm gonna skip this time, but if you wanna do it on your own, go for it because it will help you go through this. Um, and for time, I'm gonna go up actually to, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a little thing where it looks like three gray stacks of paper or four maybe gray stacks of, I guess it's three, it doesn't matter. But if you hover over it, it says data. You can click on that and it gives you a bunch of options of the first three are cool things where you can actually do a tour and it will take you um, through sort of a more guided tour. But also you can scroll down and see both different imagery and this is all sorts of different features. And I'm going to take you, actually, I'll take you to this one. This is, um, this is one of the boulders. And here you can see it's highlighted. But if I zoom in just by scrolling forward, it will take me to this boulder. And you can click on it and pull, as you might see. And you can see, actually, on top of this boulder, it looks kind of like uh, maybe like a concrete dog or something that you would might see on an old building. Uh, and, and that's why it's named a gargoyle, that all the boulders have the name Saxum. But also if I zoom out a little bit, you actually can see there's this nice crater here. This was the backup site. So if we hadn't been able to sample where we did, this was gonna be the second choice. And there's another, this really cool white boulder, but you can see how there's this sort of round circular feature that would have been a pretty nice place to try to sample in a dark spot in the middle. So Bruce, do you wanna, should I hand off to you for you to, to lead a little bit of activity? Yeah, Francis, would you like to take, take this? Uh, like this activity? Yeah, for example, where where can we land or where can we not land <laughs> if we can experiment around and see what we can find on, oh, on yeah. Bennu? Um, wait, actually I have a problem. My computer can't share screen, so that might be a problem. Uh, no, mm -hmm. not to worry. Um, let's maybe just use the chat here. You guys, if you, uh, you I've sent you the link. So if everyone can just take a tour around Bennu, and the big questions, um, can you find a site that you think would be a good place for a landing, and maybe a place that would not be? And the third question, if you could name your own asteroid, what would you name it? So have a look around Bennu and, and think about naming your asteroid. Well, everyone is doing it. If you also have questions, you can chat directly to Nicole. And then maybe, Nicole, can you see the chat now? Yeah, I can see the chat. Okay, so you guys can chat directly to Nicole if you have questions for her while you're doing this exercise at the same time. And I think we're going to come back in a few minutes to see how you guys are doing with the exercise. Sure. Um, how much time do we have uh, exactly left? Uh, we have about five minutes left officially, oh, but I think okay. how long this can be, I mean, I don't know, Nicole, if you have extra five to 10 minutes in case people have more questions. Sure, I can, I can stay on for another 10 minutes or so. I see somebody asked, how do we know exactly when the capsule will arrive? Great question. This is actually very elegant math. 
I will acknowledge I haven't done it myself, but the engineers who designed the spacecraft um, and are part of the mission have done very careful orbital calculations and they adjusted it a tiny bit, like they know roughly that it's even gonna show up um, in the afternoon because of exactly, we know where Earth's gonna be, we know how quickly the spacecraft's coming back towards us. So it's, it's really, really elegant um, orbital dynamics um, math. We've got some great names coming through in the Name the Asteroid competition. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have seen a bunch of them. <laughs> very, very creative stuff. Oh, Maple, I like that. After your German Shepherd, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Can we can we go ahead and read a few of these? Uh, I don't want to give it all away yet, but oh yeah, no, please read them as they're going by. It's great to see so many questions. I'm having to read. <laughs> okay, here, here, this could be a good one. Milkshake, um, wings of fire, outer space magic coal. Um, <laughs> some people are finding amazing boulders and making recommendations for their landing sites. Thank you awesome. for that. Um, someone found a big boulder. And it must be a big one because he sent the message like 30 times. <laughs> um, how about this one for a name? Tallow. Jupe, Jupe Mars. Oh, boy. Rocky. I like it. <laughs> oh, this is a great This is a great one. Zoomer Malstrophagus. Colder than Antarctica. Um, <laughs> most of the time. But it's kind of strange because since, for instance, um, Bennu, it doesn't have an atmosphere, so parts of it that are facing the sun can actually get kind of hot, but then once those parts rotate around, they get really cold again. So um, our atmosphere, even in Antarctica, sort of mutes that effect, and even though it is still very, very cold in Antarctica, it's, it's not as cold as most places in space. Um, great question. <laughs> I'm still going through. How about this one, Nicole? Super gravel. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great one for Bennu because it's what we call a rubble pile, right? We kind of talk about Bennu being top shaped and being mostly, like you say, rocks and, 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 and rubble. Oh boy, I don't think I can pronounce this one. Astron Tedaton. Uh, ah, sorry okay. if I didn't pronounce that correctly, Mo. I like it. Kiddios. Uh, no, go ahead. I'm getting a bit excited here. I can't believe these amazing names. They're great. Very creative. Nicole, do you want to answer a couple more questions that are coming through your chat, or we can also offer Yeah, sorry. They're going by so quickly. I miss them a lot of times. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go up here. Um, oh, here's a really good one, and I was going to ask this, actually, myself. It's from Sam, and Sam's curious. Uh, about what NASA is doing to prevent uh, Bennu from colliding with Earth, Earth, which I understand is going to maybe happen, or not collide, but there'll be a close encounter in about uh, 2135. So great questions. Uh, I was going to ask the same thing. Yeah, so we're, we're definitely keeping an eye on where Bennu is. And like you said, it's over 100 years away, but it is, um, NASA is now tracking Earth, Earth, near Earth asteroids like Bennu. Um, and we actually have an upcoming mission called the DART mission. It hasn't launched yet. And that mission is actually going to crash a spaceship into, it's an asteroid that has a slightly bigger asteroid and a little, little what we call it, sometimes people call it a moonlit, um, a secondary asteroid that orbits the main asteroid. And we're going to crash this DART spacecraft into the secondary, the small one, to see how much we can perturb um, that, that system. And this is part of the what we call planetary defense, which is defending Earth from near-Earth asteroids crashing into them. Um, and so this is a long-term project that NASA is thinking about and working on, and, and the broader international community, because um, an asteroid crashing into Earth, even one that isn't as big as the one that killed off the dinosaurs, still could cause a lot of problems in the place where it, it hits. Yeah. And we want to protect, yeah. protect human beings and, and life. Absolutely. Are you getting a few in your chat uh, yourself? Somebody says, or? how big would an asteroid have to be um, to be considered an asteroid, not a planet? It's actually not a size definition. One of the things that defines something being a planet is what we say is it's cleared out its orbit. So all of these objects go all the way around the sun, but planets like Earth and Mars, we don't have debris in our orbits because our gravity is enough to pull them all in. Um, 
And that is one of the really defining features of the planet. And I know it's very controversial, but this was part of what got Pluto demoted from being a planet, is they realized there was a bunch of other objects kind of out by Pluto that crossed its orbit. So that orbit, the orbit of Pluto wasn't cleared out by its gravity well, that there were other things that crisscross it. And so in some ways, I know I love the idea of Pluto being a planet, but it, there's also a bunch of really cool objects beyond Pluto, like Haimeamea, uh, what we call Kuiper Belt objects. Yeah. So some of it's that we got more. It's not that we have less, it's that we have more things. And fundamentally, what, whether we call something a planet or not um, is defined by humans. So we get to some basically make those rules and the uh, um, yeah. astronomical society that makes the rules about what we call a planet, what not, is something that you know may change their rules to um, allow Kuiper Belt objects, especially as we find bigger ones out there, even farther out from our sun, maybe that will change again. Some of us are still a bit upset about the Pluto thing, but we're, we're getting yeah. over it, right? Um, here's a great question from Sam again. Why wasn't it possible to prevent the uh, Chelyabinsk asteroid from colliding with Earth? Um, that was what, five mm -hmm. years ago or so? Yeah, yeah. So, um, it, actually, we didn't see it coming. It's not quite as big. It's not nearly, it wasn't nearly as big as Bennu, but it still was big to cause a lot of damage. So we're getting better and better at observing everything in the sky, but because um, it wasn't one that had been identified and we still need to do more support and more, more tracking all the potential near-Earth objects to be able to recognize um, future asteroids that might be that size. And we have recognized some, um, not ones that actually hit, or in some cases, some that have produced meteorites where people saw them coming in and then, you know, tracked it. They didn't cause as much damage, thank goodness, but there have been some that um, have yielded meteorites that people have seen all the way from orbit and then tracked in as they came to Earth. Yes. Um, Kai has been really busy uh, uh, with other students here uh, looking for rocks and boulders and he found one that's 16 meters and um, let me ask for Kai, do you think he could ha have it named after him? Is it too late for, for something like that? Sorry, say that again? Yeah, Kai, Kai found a, uh, a rock that's 16 meters on Bennu. Do you think there's any chance he might be able to get it named after him or is everything already named? So the naming theme, and again, this is so this is the not not very popular body, the International Astronomical Union that decides naming of stuff and also what is a planet and what's not. Um, you have to get things approved through them. And they have um, defined the they try to make sort of general rules for planetary bodies and almost everything on Bennu that's been named are named after like mythical birds or things related to mythical birds. So if you read some of the descriptions of boulders, they relate to that. Um, and they try also not to use names that are used elsewhere in the solar system for the most part. So there's a little bit of a tricky thing of the mission team gave the landing sites names, but then those names actually were not approved by the um, International Astronomical Union. So the boulders and other things around them and the craters themselves have slightly different names than what we called the potential landing sites. So it is one of those kind of um, it's a deliberative body. They have lots of rules. They they have their mission of not having things named the same things, but sometimes it means we don't get to name them what we want to name yes. them. A couple of good ones coming from uh, Moon and Xi'an. Or Xi'an. Uh, how much does it cost per trip to, to go to a place like Bennu? And will any humans go there? Um, so... The, uh, spacecraft missions are expensive, and a big part of the expense is the launch um, and designing the spacecraft. So I forget the exact price tag of um, the OSIRIS-REx mission, but but it, it is not cheap to do this. It, it does take a lot of very skilled engineering and effort and materials. Um, I don't think there are plans to send people to them because part of the reason we didn't land on Bennu is Bennu has very, very low gravity. It's many thousands of times lower than Earth's gravity. So you actually wouldn't stay on Bennu, right? That um, there wouldn't be enough gravity to really effectively hold a person. You could, you know, if you jumped off one of the boulders, you would reach escape velocity and not be on Bennu anymore. <laughs> so. So we may hopefully someday we'll explore with people some of the larger asteroids, but I think the little ones we won't really, even if we have people explore them, they'll just kind of approach the asteroid with a vehicle 
and probably won't really be walking around on them the way astronauts were able to walk around on the moon just because the gravity is just so much less. Um, fun. A, go ahead, Francis. Uh, I had a question that someone asked me in, why is it like studying these rocks from these asteroids like so important? And what can we like learn from studying all of these asteroids and meteorites? Yeah, that's a great question. There's sort of two main things we can learn. We can learn about how our solar system formed um, and it's particularly things that went into the precursors of the planet. So that gets into things that humans care about a lot, like the origin of water, the origin of life, um, things along those lines. But then the other side of the planetary defense of understanding the composition of these rocks from a geologic and engineering point of view, if we do at some point need to defend Earth from an asteroid, we really need to understand what we would be trying to deflect. There's a big difference between a loose pile of rocks um, and a big cohesive um, boulder or giant boulder-like object. Yeah. Um, also, another question. You mentioned earlier that um, Bennu was like a lot different than what you thought it would be. At least like you thought it was going to be really rocky. Or sorry, you thought it was going to be really like soft and sandy, but it was really rocky. So like, how did that um, happen, kind of? Yeah, so I think basically how the different particles move on the asteroid is different than we thought it would be. That we thought there would be um, either all the really tiny stuff kind of sinks in or isn't held on to the asteroid as effectively. It probably, and that it gets possibly kind of armored by those big boulders where we, like you said, we weren't expecting there to be all these big boulders. And some of that comes from, we've seen a few other asteroids that didn't have so many big boulders, uh, but they were in a little bit different orbital place too, so. I'm gonna have a couple of people just for fun to ask their question in audio. Um, they raise your hand. So I'm gonna start doing it now. Let's see. Um, Zoe, would you like to ask a question? If you guys have a question for Nicole, you can go ask a question. My little sister wants to know, how do astronauts use the bathroom in space? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a bunch of different methods. Um, they do have very specially engineered um, waste disposal systems on the International Space Station. I haven't used them myself, um, but I do have a friend who is an astronaut who um, has talked about that. I mean, I think obviously you really want the liquid to go where the liquid needs to go. So they need to engineer around that. So you're really kind of, you know, vacuuming things up and they don't escape at all. So I think there are some nice uh, YouTube videos that actually talk about that. Um, pretty cool. Yeah, I think pictures and engineering diagrams will help a lot more than, than I can. But please go, <laughs> Yasin, go, go, go your and do those. Next, Y-A-S-S-I-N. Go ahead, Yasin. Do you have a question? If not, I'll go down to the next one. Um, London? Uh, yes. I have a question. Why um, does NASA study outer space? That would be my question. Yeah. Um, we study outer space because our mission as an agency is to explore and evaluate resources. And so um, in space specifically, and that um, we also do study Earth some from space. That's another thing that NASA does as well as observing Earth um, from space um, with satellite imagery. And so we do some things that are similar to the way we study Mars, but also provide data on Earth that um, provides information for people in predicting weather and understanding um, the, the surface of the Earth better too. But but it is, that's our mission, is to, to study space and explore space. So um, you need to know about something to study it. But we also have a pure science mission as part of our, our goals, too, of, of um, for, you know, the benefit of everyone who might be interested. This is something that um, is, is our goal as mission. Nicole, we, I guess we could say that by understanding space, we understand our own planet better, too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna have Samantha to go next and then Abdu after that. Okay, Samantha, are you there? 
Daniel coming towards Earth. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble hearing you, Samantha. Okay, we didn't quite hear you. It's okay. And um, Abdul, you're you're next. Go ahead, Abdul. Can you hear us? We cannot hear you, but I think I unmuted you. Okay. Um, somehow I'm, we're having a little trouble hearing people. Uh, let's see. Um, why don't we, instead of doing that, why don't we just keep do two more questions from the chat and then we're going to wrap up. Like Bruce or Francis or Nicole, do you see any questions that you want to? Wait, um, I can talk, I think. Go ahead. So did you, so I just wanted to say something. Wait, what? Go ahead. Okay, never mind. Go ahead, Nicole and Bruce or Francis. Any questions you want to answer from the chat? From Arissa asked um, about people being able to live on Mars or the moon. I think at some point in the future, people will be able to live on the moon or Mars. I think we have multiple steps of, we need to send people back to the moon and, and, Mar and then eventually get to Mars and build sort of space stations or bases like there. Um, I think it, to change either the moon or Mars into something that people could live with without a base um, will take a long time. But I think I think it is very foreseeable that we could have humans living in bases on either of those planets um, if it's something that we really are inspired to do. Here's a very good one. Are there any fossilized bacteria or organisms on these meteorites or, or asteroids? And do they give us any clues about uh, life? So this is um, a great question. There's those of us who are older will remember that there is a very big news story in the mid 90s, which I know for all of you is long before you were born, <laughs> um, about where scientists thought they had found evidence for a fossilized bacteria in a meteorite that came from Mars. So most meteorites come from the asteroid belt, but we do have a couple hundred that come from Mars. And um, approaching a, a little over a thousand that come from the moon. And so one of the meteorites from Mars, somebody found these little spheral things that they thought might be fossilized evidence for magnetotactic bacteria. It hasn't been continued to be widely accepted, but it did really inspire everyone to rethink about um, life evolving on Mars. And including to the current rovers we have exploring Mars, a big part of their underlying mission is to figure out if bacteria might have lived on Mars in the past or maybe even in places that aren't easy for us to detect are on Mars now. And that would be another life forming event in our solar system, which would be a really incredible and special thing. We, we really value how special life is on Earth. And if we could find it in a, another place in our solar system that evolved separately, that would be um, a, a just incredible discovery for science. We're gonna have one last question coming from someone, but before we pick that, I'm also going to open the chat. I'm going to ask everyone to type in in the chat. Tell us one thing that you learned today that you thought was really interesting. 